Good. Well, it's morning here. It's uh, seven thirty in the morning in the United States in Massachusetts, which is the state I live in. Um, and I'm excited to be sharing with you, but the technology piece is definitely challenging to me. So bear with me, but um, I'm excited to be able to share. Horses are my passion, but I do have a soft spot in my heart for India. I've been there several times um, and I hope to come again this October. So we'll, uh, kind of go from there. So I it, I want this to be participatory. I know Dr. Neufeld, I watched his presentation on um, heart disease in dogs and I was really challenged that it would be great to be participatory. So I'm not gonna go through a great deal of information. I'm gonna, um, but I also am depending on Dr. Dixon to kind of help me along the way in the chat box due to the technology piece. So um, I, equine lameness, when Dr. Dixon asked me to speak, it's a huge topic and it's kind of like, where do I begin? It's just like huge. So I thought I would kind of narrow in on emergency. So in, the, in other words, something that you would need to be seen, that would need to be seen immediately. But in doing that, I really need to kind of go back to the basics so um, today we're gonna do, I'm gonna say part one because maybe I'll do it again. Um, but anyways, we're gonna just have an overview of lameness in the horse. Um, we're gonna go to how to perform a lameness exam. And to be honest with you, examination, whether it's a dog, cat, horse, whatever, all basically is done somewhat the same. Um, your familiarity may be a little different, but the exam is done. So just even if you don't ever touch horses, um, I think it's a good reminder of how to do a good examination. Um, and we're gonna talk about type of lamenesses that we may see in an emergency situation that may need to be seen right away. And then I'm gonna do two case presentations that I'm gonna ask you to help me solve. So um, we'll see how this all goes, but I'm excited to do it, so let's go. That is a, full, a mare and a foal at my, we raise horses and that's a mare and foal there. So it's kind of a cute picture. So I did in, use some of um, the horses from my farm here. So um, needless to say, you don't have any snow, but this is this was taken this December. So um, lameness, I just wanna go over a basic um, definition for lameness. And this is true of lameness in any species. So it's, the movement with a limp is a symptom or a clinical sign. It's um, equine lameness has been defined as an alteration in the animal's normal stance or mode of progression caused by pain or mechanical dysfunction. That's true of any species, what lameness is, what it is in us when we're lame. So um, it's very basic. So I just, um, the musculoskeletal system is probably the most evaluated system in the horse, um, on maybe unlike other species, but I think as a veterinarian, if you do horses, typically most of the time it would be the musculoskeletal system. And detecting the source of lameness can sometimes be very difficult because sometimes the signs aren't always that obvious. And um, but the clinical signs could be swelling, heat discharge, the atrophy of the muscles, and number one is usually a lameness. So the three lame, three reasons for the lameness again is pain, it hurts, um, mechanical interference, like you have scar tissue somewhere that the horse cannot move normally. When I was in cashmere. I would see horses being used going up into the mountains that had had a broken limb and the limb had not healed correctly, but those horses were still limping up into the mountain, taking people up into the mountains. Um, and then there could be neurologic disease that causes them not to move their limbs normally. And I think doing a lameness examination to me is like being a detective. Um, just like a dog or a cat that may come in, a dog, 
easily to do a lame neck. Cats are very difficult to do lameness exams on, but dogs is that you, number one, you need to identify the location of the lameness. What leg is it lame in? And, and then you need to do diagnose what the problem is and then come up with a treatment plan. So these are just also just a lameness exam on any species. So, but we're talking about a horse. So just like any examination, what do we do? We get, what's the signalment? In other words, how old is it? Um, what sex is it? You know, what is the environment it's kept in? How long has the owner been noticing and uh, having an issue? Has it ever had any previous health issues at all? Did it come on today or has it been coming on for the last couple days, the last week, the last month, the last year. Um, if it moves around, does it make the lameness worse? Um, is it is it more obvious when it first when they first go out in the morning? Um, is there any known trauma? Have you started to treat it in any way? And is there any pattern to the lameness? Again, that goes along with, when do you see the lameness? So it's just it just like, again, a, a equine lameness is just like a lameness exam done, in, done on any species of animal that may, cows, dogs, cats. Cats are difficult, but. <laughs> um, and when I start this about this equine lameness exam, I start with, I'm going to say palpation, but sometimes it also is just watching the animal move. But since I had to kind of put it one way or another in a slide, I figured that I would start. And we're talking emergency, so oftentimes you don't need to see sometimes this animal move a lot. But um, so it may start with palpation feeling for any heat, swelling, or pain. Um, you, um, with a horse, um, you may want to see, um, look at the hoof. Most of the time we say that most of the lameness is in a horse is, you may think it's in the shoulder, but 90% of the time it's in the hoof or in the lower limb. Um, if the horse wears shoes, you may want to see how the shoe is worn. You may want to see what the hoof looks like if it doesn't wear shoes. Um, oftentimes we go ahead and we hoof test for pain and I'm going to go over how to do this. And then further, we may do a nerve block, but I'm going to go to localize where it is, but I'm going to go into detail. But now we're going to kind of go is that observation piece. Sometimes we don't jump in and palpate right away. we stand back and we look. We look at the animal, we look at the horse. How is the horse standing? How, what does the head look like? Again, like a dog, um, you may be looking, you know, what does it look like? Is it favoring one limb or the other? You, I think you can tell a lot from a distance. Sometimes you can notice whether they're holding the leg up, whether there is um, not bearing full weight. Um, as far as a horse, oftentimes, Confirmation has a lot to do with lameness. And so you may want to see, does this horse have a healed broken leg? <laughs> like I saw in cashmere, um, does the horse's limb turn out and deviate just like in a dog that may have some sort of conformational problem where um, one of your small breeds that the legs go in every, every what direction. So, um, and then you basically say, okay, I've looked at it. I've noted these things, put this in your, in your mental, you know, in your mental checklist. And then you say, okay, let's move the horse. Let's walk. So you want to look and you want to look at the horse walk back and forth. You want to, you may walking in motion. You may want to see it on various surfaces and doing, um, going in a circle. So this is again at the walk in the straight line. You may be going up and down an incline. You may be backing up in an emergency situation. All you may have to do is walk the horse 
you'll say, this horse is really lame in the left front leg. You won't have to go any further. Then you'll do your palpations and going from there. But in the horse, sometimes there's a lot of lamenesses that are very subtle. And you really have to do this whole process. So, and you know that in a dog, sometimes a dog can come in and it's very subtle. And it's sometimes when it comes into the office, adrenaline is a wonderful thing. And sometimes they get excited and you don't always see it. So these are all a process that we need to do as a veterinarian in any species that we're gonna do a lameness exam on. So in a horse, you may look in a straight line you may go in a circle, these horses lunge on a line and they go left or right, or they may be ridden. And then from there, maybe with horses, we do flexion tests. And I know in dogs, I do flexion tests on my, on my dogs too, to see what joints may be affected. And there's a whole process in doing that. I'm not this, I'm not gonna do this in this, in this context, but we could do that in a greater detail at a separate time. So in horses, we grade lamenesses. We grade them one through five. Zero is they're not lame. <laughs> um, one is that it's really difficult to see. In other words, you see it sometimes in certain circumstances, like when maybe, um, and I'm gonna go along with a dog that you may see it when you're walking the dog up and you turn it. <laughs> You may see it only at that point in time, but it's very inconsistent. The same thing with horses. It's not seen all the time, but it's seen enough that there's definitely an issue. Uh, grade two is that it's not consistent, um, but when trotting in a, straight, in a straight line, but it is consistent in certain circumstances, like since when it's circling, when it's on a hard surface. So you basically these each grade becomes more significant. The third grade three is that it's seen consistently consistently at the trot, like in all circumstances. These these animals that I'm going to present in my in my um, uh, cases today are all on the four to five. So but you can see it kind of in, it increases. So in other words, so a grade three, you may not see them at the walk, but you see the lameness at the trot. And then the grade four, you'll see it at the walk and the trot. And grade five, they're holding the leg up or they're toe touching. So it just all increases. So once you have, and I know that a lot of these things that I talk about and mention that are tests that can be done, they're not in the realm of what you'll do. They're not in the realm of what I do and I do a lot of horse work, but a few of them are. And I think it's it's important to bring bring up just like, um, depends on where you are, what you're doing, what you can do. But you can do all the testing diagnostics that we can do that you don't need any real equipment. You just need to be um, observant, um, but you could increase, you could do x-rays, you could do ultrasounds. You could do thermography where you're testing heat. You could do um, nuclear scintigraphy where you're basically injecting radioactive material in and it, it's picked up in an inflamed area. You could do CTs. You could tap the joints. If it's the hind end, you may do a rectal exam to see if this seems like there's a broken pelvis. Um, if there's swelling, you may biopsy it. You may do force gait analysis and you may do um, cinematography, gait analysis. But I mean, that's just high tech and it's not what we do. But I think you need to talk about it is because all these things are done. But the most important thing is to be an observant person and use all your senses. So here I am. This is my first case. This is Dewey, and I think that I would say that donkeys are humbling. You may think you know a lot about horses, but donkeys are humbling. So I thought, um, and we need something in our repertoire or what we do every day to make us humble. And this is a miniature donkey. I've known Dewey since he was very young because I castrated him. He is now in his late teens, and he's owned by a wonderful um, um, husband and wife, 
now the kids are all grown because I've known all the donkeys and ponies all through the years. And, um, but now they have Dewey and Dewey, they, um, owner called in the morning and said, Dewey ca is um, toe touching um, and he's limping on one leg. So it came on suddenly. In other words, one day it was fine and the next day it wasn't. And it's lameness is, so it came on immediately. So it's, um, and it's lameness is right front and it's pretty significant. I'm putting it as a grade four to five. It probably should be say a five. So it's an emergency. So it's, it meets that criteria. So I need to go out and take care of it as a veterinarian right away because the people are concerned. So when it, when I go out there, I observe that I don't need to move it much because it's, not, it's obviously lame. I don't see any obvious swelling by observing it. And because I know in my, in my clinical experience that most of the time when you see an animal that is toe touching um, and lame, the first thing I need to do is look and feel for digital pulse. Because most of the time, these horse, these animals are going to be lame in the foot. And so I'm going to feel for a pulse. Um, and um, I will go over a little bit later how to do that. But basically, um, and again, there's no heat of swelling. But so when that happens, I start doing more diagnostics. And um, one of them is a hoof tester. And I will show you what that is. And I will tell you, doing a hoof tester exam on a little donkey that doesn't normally get held is very humbling and um, you know, in very much predicament. But this is a hoof tester. Um, so I'm doing the hoof tester because I found that there was an increased digital pulse. And this puts pressure on certain areas of the foot. You go all around and you, and you, check and see where it hurts because then we're, if you can find out where it hurts then you can maybe use a, a hoof knife and find try to find if there could be an abscess so i just want to go over again if i have a horse or a donkey that's non weight or you have a even you know this is true of a cow um you have a non weight bearing um, animal that doesn't have a lot of swelling, the first thing I'm going to think of is this animal has a hoof abscess. Um, is the hoof hot? In other words, is there heat in the hoof? Um, is there an increased digital pulse? Usually there's no fever because it's localized and usually it's only in one foot. Um, see down here in the lower picture is how you should do a check for the pulse in a horse because you have a vein artery and nerve on either side in the pastern area and that's how you feel you got to remember that you have to be careful when you feel for digital pulse because you do have a um a slight pulse in your thumb so usually you should use your fingers um so the um you could could think that you could have an infected joint or tendon sheath but usually in these, you would have some sort of um, history of wound or trauma. And oftentimes there's a, 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 some sort of temperature and oftentimes there's swelling. But you could have an infection in the hoof from trauma that looks like a foot abscess. Or it could be a fracture. <laughs> My dad always said that if you're called in the middle of the night, and the horse is non-weight bearing. It's either a foot abscess or it's a fracture. So what is your differential diagnosis for Dewey? So if you can tell me what you think could be wrong with Dewey. He's got mild pulse. He doesn't have any swelling and he's sensitive to the hoof testers. Or if there's any more information you wanna know. Yeah, encourage. Uh, yeah, something. Uh, Doctor Aisha's return foot ab foot abscess. 
Yes. <laughs> yeah, that definitely. And Dewey, um, and I'm going to go. Um, yeah, that was my first thought. I mean, I will say when I went out to see him, um, and even when someone called on the phone, I said that he's got a foot abscess and he's had foot abscesses before. It's very common. Um, but the one thing when I went out there, the, the, the pulse in the foot was not like, it was not a, what I call a bounding pulse. And a bounding pulse means like, you know, when you hurt your finger and you have an infection under your nail and your thumb pounds, that's the same thing what I call a bounding pulse, which is usually what you feel when you have an abscess in the foot on, an, on a horse or a donkey. This wasn't, but I didn't feel any swelling and I couldn't get any pain necessarily on him. And he was very sensitive to the hoof testers. Um, so I'm going to go. So when I looked at the bottom of his foot, though, when I cleaned up the foot, with a hoof knife, um, which is, you know, what, uh, like, a, um, it, it's made for the hoof. Um, I found that on the sole, there was somewhat, as I cleaned away the foot, there was somewhat of a defect on the sole. I, my arrow probably doesn't show, but anyways, there was a defect. And that's right where, when I use a hoof testers across this area, he basically about laid down. And then one, one thing I can say about donkeys, once donkeys lay down, it's really hard to get them to get up and cooperate. They are not cooperative. Um, and again, usually you feel like you've been in a fight when, by the time you're done. And they're also little. But again, I think um, God has a fun way of making us humble in, our, in what we do every day. But um, Anyway, so a hoof abscess. So a, how I how I would how would you treat a hoof abscess? Can someone tell me how they would treat a foot abscess? Drain. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, the thing is that sometimes you can't. <laughs> It's not obvious to begin with. You have an area, you may even, like I had this one area in his foot that I, you know, I could find that I thought maybe there would have been maybe a puncture or an entry, but there was no drainage. But oftentimes a foot abscess, you'll use it. And uh, an abscess can happen like from trauma on the sole, but it also can happen from something that works up along the white line, which is kind of a rim where the, sensitive part of the foot meets the insensitive part of the outside. And sometimes you can just have something or you can have a bruise that that ends up being an abscess. Um, so sometimes it's not obvious. So sometimes we have to soak. Um, there is one, uh, Dr. Helen, there is one more answer. Okay. Uh, Dr. Aisha has written with bandaging. Yep. Yep. That's right. And Absolutely. Animal, animal index. Absolutely, you got it. Absolutely. Yeah. The other gentleman okay. has written, open it and drain it, then apply poultic. Yes. Poultice, yeah. Yep, poultice. That's exactly. Um, so exactly, you've got it. Absolutely. Um, again, though, sometimes it doesn't always come right away. So the animal lintex poultices work well. Warm water and Epsom salts, just warm water. Um, and I will tell you, and you can bandage it many different ways. Um, my, my dad, I can remember many years ago when I was a child, him using um, a burlap bag and soaking a horse's foot with a burlap bag. Now we have a lot of disposable things that we can use. Um, some people use diapers, um, but anyways, in whatever way you can, and if you can't wrap the foot, at least you can soak it in some sort of bucket or put it in some stream or some way of doing warm water works well, but you don't have to. Um, and sometimes it takes time for it to come. Um, so that those are all great answers because that's what it, um, and what you, the best case scenario is to go and diagnose an area 
use your hoof knife and it opens up and then you're you're good but sometimes you can even have it go on a few days a few weeks and even months um, with a foot abscess sometimes it's very deep so um, so two weeks later Dewey is still lame so what are your thoughts now as far as what do you think could be wrong do you think it's still a foot abscess what else do you think what are your thoughts Can unmute and you can speak directly to Dr. Helen, or you can put your answers in the chat box. We need to take X-ray. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's that's that that's um. What are my thoughts? Is okay. What is what? Is, what was my at my dad's? What I can hear him speaking in my. It's either a foot abscess or it's a fracture. So um. So what are the diagnostic tests you like? Yep. Radiographs, that's exactly. So there it is. Um, and again, it's humbling to take a radiograph on a little miniature donkey in someone's backyard. It's just definitely humbling. But um, I, I also wanna say that you could, because in the beginning, because the, the donkey only had, um, say you went and you had um, SARM and he was, you know, he had moderate pulse and he was not sensitive to the hoof testers, but you saw it, eh, it's still probably a foot abscess, even though there was not a great deal of sensitivity with the hoof testers. You could do a nerve block at this point in time. Um, but no, it, it since he was sensitive to the hoof testers and we knew that there was a defect in the bottom of the foot, it makes sense to do hoof um, radiographs. Now there was, Whenever you do radiographs, just like in a dog or a cat, you always should do two views. So I only show you one view, but I can tell you that there were four views done. And um, the basically we saw was that the defect that was in was only at the bottom. It didn't go up to the coffin bone or the third phalanx, okay? Um, so it, you know, because you have to worry, is there, you know, if, if this puncture went all the way up, it could have a bone infection or osteomyelitis, right? Um, so this does not appear to be the case. So, um, this is, this is the third failing. So the coffin bone, um, which is both basically in the hoof capsule. So, um, so I just kind of want to go over, and I don't think that you have this problem with laminitis in India, at least the horses that I saw. And I have to say, when I was in southern India, I only saw one horse drive through the street. It was a cart horse, which was very skinny, so I don't think it would have laminitis. And when I was up in Kashmir, those horses are cared for. I mean, they take good care of their animals up there, but I would say that they're on the thin side. But in the United States, we tend to overfeed our animals. So when you have a lameness that comes on like this acutely, we have to think about laminitis. And I just really thought, which is inflammation of the feet that is usually seen when the animal is over overfed and too fat, but sometimes you can have laminitis from concussion or um, trotting down, like down the roads, you know, down the city streets, you could have uh, laminitis from that. Now I would say that in the United States, we don't see that, but I could see that happening possibly in India. Um, and, but these horses typically are lame in both front feet, but occasionally come just one foot. And they usually rock back on their hind end because you got to remember, horses bear most of their weight on their front limbs. So they are rocking back and with their front feet and they have a very uh, typical stance. Um, and they lay down a lot to get, get off their feet. But again, non-weight bearing in one leg. Again, we have 
an abscess in the foot, we could have an infection or a fracture, but basically that's where we're at. So those are. So um, this is, um, I'm gonna present the next case, but this is taken in Kashmir when I was there in 2010. Um, we went up with the Gujars and we were, these are as this was in June. So they were um, migrating up into the Himalayas for um, pasture land for their animals. Um, this is a little girl along the way. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and um, it, it, it was a trip of a lifetime, so. So this is Reba. Reba is, um, uh, she is a, a mare. Um, she is a Morgan. She is pregnant, probably five months pregnant. Needless to say, she gets plenty to eat. <laughs> um, she is um, in her late teens, like 17 or 18 years old. Um, she goes, um, she was fine in the morning. Um, in this situation, the horse is not out of pasture all the time. She was fine in the morning when she was brought out to pasture. And she went, um, but when they went out to bring her in, they found that she was toe touching lame on her right hind. There was no significant increase in pulse. There was no sensitivity to the hoof testers and there was no obvious wound. Um, there was just a very, very, very slight swelling in the proximal metatarsal area or like what we call the hawk. And so I wanted, want you to ask, what are your thoughts and what diagnostic tests would you like to do? Or what, what would you like to know? Um, I'll tell you that this horse goes out with other horses. That's a good information. Um, would you use hoof testers on her? Yeah, there's a one answer from Dr. Aisha. No block of low and high four points ultrasound. Boy, you're sharp, you're right. So let me go on, awesome. So basically what we did um, in this case was because even though there was not much pulse and there was not much um, um, heat or swelling and not much sensitive to the hoof testers, um, we, it was thought that, you know, the presentation is so typical of a foot abscess. And sometimes that is the case. It can go outside and come in with a foot abscess. So that's not uncommon. So just because most of the time lamenesses are seen um, in the distal limb and a baxial sesamoid nerve block was done, which is basically putting local anesthetic over the sesamoid bones there's a vein, artery, and nerve that are in that area. And usually we put about four cc's, this vein, artery, nerve on the inside and outside. And so there, a, a baxial sesamoid nerve block was performed on this horse and um, there was no improvement. So we've kind of ruled out the foot. Um, so, um, and we just basically look at, start looking closer and we just notice, well, maybe we should clip. There's this teeny, teeny, teeny amount of swelling. Um, maybe we should investigate that. So we clipped it and there was a scrape. So what other diagnostic tests would you like to do at this point in time? There is one thing is given by Sarah, flexion test. Flexion, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, she 
is a yeah, flexion test. Yep, that's true. She's and she was very positive. She very positive. She you could barely hold her. Yeah, that would that bothered her. Um, anything else? There is a, one more thing has come. Radiograph of cannon bone. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So so more diagnostic. So basically the test would be um flexion test, you could do that. Yeah. Um, you could also do more diagnostic nerve blocks, which was mentioned by someone early. In other words, okay, she didn't block below, but you go high. Um, you could do an ultrasound because remember there was some swelling. Um, or you can do radiographs because she's really, really lame. So you would do, could do any of those. So that's, um, so this is what we found. This is the choice that we did was we did radius. We had a swell, we had some swelling um, and we found a fracture of the fourth metatarsal bone. And we did, there, this was not the only view, there was multiple views done. Um, and remember the horse did go, she did what, she was out with other horses. So she probably got kicked, even though there was not, there was just a little scrape, but she probably got kicked. The fracture did not appear to be articular. So um, that, um, so um, um, prognosis is good. Um, so what would you do? Um, what would you, what would be the next thing you would do to treat this horse? She's pregnant. She's, you know, so what would you do to treat her? She has a fracture of her splint, what we call her splint bone or her fourth metatarsal bone. Mm -hmm. uh, cuss. Yeah, you could, you could cast, you could cast it. Um, yeah, you could. Bandaging and nutrition supplements and rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Both those are options, yeah. So this is what we did. Stall rest um, um, and bandage, heavy bandage. Um, the biggest thing with casting is that sometimes the casts have their own problems. And because the fracture in that area is very stable, uh, because the cannon bone is really um, stabilizing the splint bone, right? And it's not involving the joint. So basically you almost You've got the best case scenario that you can have. So it was it was decided to just do a heavy bandage and and rest her. Um, and to use um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, for a period of time to get the inflammation up and then re-radiograph in four to six weeks. And when we do st stall rest, basically she would what we would do is she was still kept in the barn in her box stall, but she would, and it was a big stall and she would, but in a few days when she was come, in a few weeks, a couple of weeks when she was more comfortable, then they would bring her out and walk her a little bit, slowly bringing her back. But usually these type of fractures have a good prognosis um, and they do come back completely um, to soundness. So I, I guess in conclusion, I just want you to remember, just like I remember always what my dad said, if you have a non-weight bearing horse, one leg, there's two things you need to think of. I either have a foot abscess or I have a fracture. And I think, you know, even if you don't ever touch a horse, um, I think that your examination as a veterinarian 
is that we are taught to be detectives and it's fun kind of finding the answer to the mystery. And I think sometimes lame, lamenesses in horses can be a mystery as they can be in a dog. So questions. This picture is taken when I was in Southern India um, with Dr. Benjamin. So good memories. Uh, this is a time for us. And I think that anybody wants to ask question to Dr. Helen pertaining to this topic. And you can unmute yourself, you can ask directly, or you don't want to ask, you can put the question in the chat box. If you want to know more information, she'll be happy to do that. We have 10 more minutes. Dr. Helen? Yes. Yes. What are the uh, analgesics you can use in the horses? Any drug of choices? For non steroidal anti inflammatory, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, we, we use phenylbutazone. Um, we use um, flunix and megalamine. So um, that's basically what we use most of the time in horses for non steroidal anti um, we can use meloxicam, but I don't think it works as well. Um, and we can use a product called Equiox. But um, so those are kind of the products that we typically use um, in the States. Um, and we do use um, a, a topical diclofenac. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. We are using Malaxicam here yeah. in India. You are. Do you think, I don't, I've used it a little bit, but I don't ever think it makes that much difference, but. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, anybody wants, ah, this question is there from Dr. Aisha. How to stabilize a fracture to send the horse to referral hospital? Yeah, like depending, like that would need it because it doesn't, but if you had a, it depends on where it is. Um, so I would say that most of the time is that I remember, I'm just going to kind of give as a, as a, as an example, um, if I had, uh, let's say I had um, a fracture of the um, cannon bone on the front, front limb, um, I would use something like a piece of wood on the front of the cannon bone. And then I would wrap it tightly to stabilize it. Um, so, um, if I had to go to referral and it was, you could put, um, and say you had a fracture more like up in the humerus or up in the femur, what you would do is you would take, a, we use PVC pipe along uh, here. Um, you could take a piece of a uh, plank, uh, a piece of wood or something very strong and put it alongside of the animal wrap the leg to begin with, and then, then wrap the piece of solid material, whether it's a piece of plastic, but it's gotta be strong, um, or a piece of wood, but it, the wood can't be that heavy along the outside of the leg to keep it stable to move it. So you can get the animal into um, a trailer to move, but it, where you exactly we put those splints, those temporary splints, depends on where the fracture is. Um, you can use a broom. I mean, if it was a if it was a donkey, you could probably use a strong broom handle. But you know, a, a big horse, you couldn't do that. But you do the best you can. But it can't be too heavy. But I think you, people can be really ingenious. Plastic works very well. Strong plastic. Like PV, we have PVC which works really well um, to do it, um, and it works. Really How about well. using POP? What? 
How about using plaster of Paris bandages? You can, but the thing is, if you are moving to a referral hospital, you want something you can get off quickly. Do you know what I mean? The plaster of Paris type bandage would be used if you were going to treat it, not necessarily get it to the facility. But if you wanted to cast it, you could use plaster of Paris. But it would take longer, you know, and if you're going to go to a referral hospital, I mean, you could. Yeah, sure, you could. But plaster of Paris, to me, in making a splint out of it, isn't that strong as far as a splint. There's but it, a it works well to cast. There's one more question in the chat box. How do you manage the lameness due to back problem? How ah. do you manage it? <laughs> that is a big, that's, that's a whole, that's like a week of talks. Um, I, number one is I would make sure it's not coming from, sometimes people will think lameness is in the back is, is from, is prime, uh, like, a, it's like if you have a lameness, you need to rule out that there's nothing going on in the lower limb first because sometimes the pain up in the back can be secondary to something else. And if you've ruled out that you don't have a, the other type of problem, um, as far as doing diagnostics in the back, it really depends on where in the back it is because certain parts of the back, number one is your palpation skills, trying to try to find out where exactly it's painful because the back in a horse is very complicated. So if once you determine where the fracture is, say if you find, or not fracture, say the pain is, say you think it's over the withers, so it's in the front. Now we can take radiographs of the withers, but when you get to the back part of the horse, you can't take radiographs well. Um, it could be fractures of the wither, you could have kissing spine, but as you get back, you can't sue. So the ultrasound is used more in the back of the horse. So you do diagnostics that way, but you also have a lot of muscle and things going on. So sometimes trying to find out what exactly is going on in the back can be very difficult and sometimes requires a lot more diagnostic skills and sometimes treatment um, or trying certain treatments, but that's, that's, that's a big topic.